This is the, the, the Analysis in Chains with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. <laughs> Welcome to Analysis in Chains. I'm Nathan Williams, and joining me today is Radoslav Albrecht, the founder and CEO of Bitbond. You may remember Radoslav as he was our very first interview that we did on Analysis in Chains back in the old days when dinosaurs roamed the earth and Bitcoin was on its way up, approaching a thousand dollars. And since then, he's preparing an STO, a security token offering. Radoslav, thank you for coming back on the show. Thank you so much for having me again. It's a pleasure to be back. So, Radoslav, you're, you're doing an STO. Now, what exactly does that mean and how is it different from a standard ICO? So an STO stands for Security Token Offering, which means that we and everybody else who launches an STO are offering a token that actually represents a real security, which means that there is some kind of asset behind that token. While most ICOs that have been running were utility tokens, where the utility token would typically represent a form of payment or a platform specific currency with which you can pay to receive, for example, services on a specific platform. But there is no real underlying asset, but the utility comes from the usage as a currency, while security tokens uh, represent certain assets. In our case, in the case of the BitBond STO, um, our token represents a bond, which means that we are paying a fixed coupon on the token and we are using the proceeds into, uh, in, in order to invest them into small business loans through the BitBond platform. So everybody who subscribes to the token and who invests in it has an exposure to a highly diversified portfolio of small business loans. So how is this different than what Bitbond was doing before? Because, I mean, you've had this platform for many years. You're one of the grandfathers of the Berlin startup uh, crypto community. You, you've been doing these small business loans. So what's changed? So Bitbond has grown quite significantly over the last two to three years. Um, in 2016, we received our license from the German financial regulator BaFin. And since then, we've added a number of institutional investors to our platform. And uh, we have grown our loan origination from back then around about 100,000 euros a month to now over a million euros a month. And in order to grow the platform further, and there's a lot of demand for SME loans in Europe and also other parts of the world, we are looking for efficient ways to, to raise more capital to be deployed into SME loans. And so one of that, those ways obviously is to go to the public markets but being a company that's very familiar and has a lot of expertise in the crypto uh, space we thought well if, if we issue a conventional bond that's kind of boring why not go one step further why not make it accessible to a much broader audience and give everybody the opportunity to participate in the returns of the SME loans on our portfolio um, but at the same time allow them to participate in a very simple way where they don't need to manage a portfolio themselves but where they simply buy a fixed income product where they enjoy the returns without the hustle of managing your own portfolio and so here we are today with the Bitbond token which represents a portfolio of loans, but you don't need to manage it. You just receive fixed coupon payments and a variable coupon every year. So the thing is, uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about STOs going forward. A lot of people have been excited uh, in the past few months about the prospect of STOs, but I think it's still a little bit early to say if it's going to be a repeat of the uh, excitement that we saw in, for example, 2017. What's your sense on the state of the market just from having gone through the process? Do you think that people are really excited now about STOs or do you think that it's going to uh, really catch fire uh, in the coming months? Or I believe people are getting very excited about STOs. However, I don't think we will see such a huge 
hype coming so quickly as we had it with ICOs simply because of the barriers of entry are much higher for the companies that are issuers of STOs. Um, at Bitbond we went through a one year long process in order to figure out the exact setup of our token of which approximately three months were the time during which we submitted our prospectus to the regulator for approval and then ultimately until we got it approved. And so with ICOs, um, it is an unregulated market where everybody can launch it within a day if they want, while STOs being securities, even if we cut out a couple of middlemen out of the process, uh, one aspect that you have to maintain and that you cannot cut out is to write a proper securities prospectus that complies with all the securities laws uh, where you want to launch this and then have it approved by the regulator. So that this slows down the process a bit and you need to have a team that has a certain level of expertise and experience with the securities markets. Now, does this make you subject to, for example, um, a similar oversight as uh, uh, as, as a publicly listed company would be. Uh, I mean, I know that there's a difference between, for example, an equity uh, security token and uh, a bond security token, but I'm just wondering sort of how cautious the regulators are and how much oversight that you can expect by going and doing something like that. So it definitely increases the level of transparency that uh, we provide to the public. Um, for example, in our case uh, of a bond, we need to um, publicize audited financial statements every year uh, because the variable coupon that we are paying depends on the pre-tax profit of our investments. So we have to disclose that. And it's normally something that as a startup company, you wouldn't do to that level of detail. However, if we were to launch an equity product, and the same is of course true for other companies as well, then the level of um, reporting requirements would even be much higher depending on uh, the, the, the product and the type of financing that you're raising. Plus, one other important aspect is different levels of equity markets and different standards. And the prime standard, for example, requires you to publicize actually quarterly audited financial statements, while in lower level standard uh, equities markets, you only, for example, have to do that once per year. And therefore, the step that we have now taken brings us closer to being a public company. Um, as I said, we do have to publicize annual financial reports. However, it's, it's not the same level of transparency and of reporting that we would need to provide if we were a publicly listed company that has stock of its equity listed in a prime standard. So there's a spectrum of transparency that is required. Now, when people are doing STOs, security tokens, um, it really does seem like we're moving away from the original crypto image that, uh, that we have of the uh, crypto anarchists and Satoshi Nakamoto, the person or the group or whoever it was, creating a rogue coin that no one is in charge of, that no one uh, can control. Do you think that this move toward STOs that uh, we will expect marks a fundamental shift in the industry? Or do you think we're always going to have this sort of anarchist decentralized group in the uh, Bitcoin space? I believe we're going to have both. We, I mean, con Bitcoin to this date still continues to be the coin with the highest market cap. And personally, I expect uh, Bitcoin to remain um, the coin with the highest market cap, at least for the foreseeable near future. Um, so you still have that and you still have um, people publishing their own public blockchain, um, hoping to replace Bitcoin, hoping to replace uh, uh, Ethereum. So this is something that's still ongoing. There may be less ICOs today, but I'm sure that even the ICO wave will come back at some point. And at the same time, um, STOs are coming up and uh, I, I agree with you that there will be more and more and we will be seeing a relatively big wave of STOs and they will just add to the diversity and to the innovation in the space in general. I think we're going to have both and we will see which types of coins will receive the highest level of attention and the highest level of investment. But overall, I think STOs are a complement to the unregulated and to the, to the very 
uh, almost anarchic coins like Bitcoin. One of the crazy things I've been thinking of recently is just that there's been so much attention to blockchain and cryptocurrency, but specifically because a lot of people made a lot of money very quickly. And then a lot of people lost a lot of money, money very quickly as well. And so the majority of, I guess, retail investors, that's about the depth that they are willing or are interested in understanding uh, the technology and the systems that come from it. But one thing that I've been thinking about is, is there a way of removing or changing uh, the model so that you can end up having fully proper decentralized models without uh, a highly volatile utility token. And I had heard a couple of people uh, playing around with this idea of using a combination of two tokens, a security token and a stable coin, where the security token would grant rights for the protocol or for fees collected from the protocol, and then the stable coin would be used to actually make payments on the protocol, whatever it is. Do you think that there that we're going to see more of these type of innovations or more of these protocols coming up to decentralize different functions and different platforms? Or do you think that in a, in the medium to even long term, we're going to see just more centralized models taking over? I hope. And at the same time, I actually do believe that we will see more of the first example that you described, <laughs> where you have a decentralized system with a stable coin on top of it that kind of well guarantees is maybe the wrong word but that tries to make sure that there is stability and value on top of a decentralized system actually at bitmon we're a really good example of a use case for that uh, we work together with a company called tempo uh, which is based in france which is the issuer of the euro t a euro denominated stable coin on top of the stella blockchain mm -hmm. so the stella blockchain is a decentralized system and now many Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> hardcore maximalists will say, well, Stella is not the same as Bitcoin. <laughs> Fine, it may, it may not be the exact same thing. <laughs> However, it's a, it's a, I would say, fairly well decentralized system, which is permissionless, which is open, which is fully transparent. And the market price of the native currency on Stella, Stella Lumens, is, is relatively volatile, very much the same volatility that you experience with Bitcoin. And at the same time, now Tempo are issuing a stablecoin on top of that, which is backed by a audited euro balance. And, and we're actually using these euro tokens uh, in our payment processing for our core business at Bitbond. And I believe that we're going to see more and more of these types of use cases. Oh, really? Um, again, as a compliment, right? I, I, I believe we'll still have Bitcoin in a couple of years as a fully decentralized, um, fully issuer independent uh, system, but there will be different use cases and different use cases require different technologies and different types of coins. And for our use case, actually the, the, the Euro stable coin is, is, is a great, great combination of a stable value with fast uh, and cheap payment processing. It's interesting that you bring that up. I'm curious as to your thoughts about the prevalence of stable coins will have going forward, specifically because one thing that I've been thinking of a lot is that with utility tokens, because you're combining sort of these incentive models with a intrinsically unstable value coin, they're disincentivized from using the token in a platform because you could use it or you could just hold it and wait for the value to go up and it's sort of like it's difficult to incentivize people to pay with ether or bitcoin if they expect the value to go up or down significantly and um it, it it's is strange that it almost seems counterintuitive that you can't yeah, is that, or rather, not counterintuitive, but that there are two opposing uh, uses and desires for for each coin. Do you think that the stable coins are really going to be the future? Well, I don't think they're the only future, but I think they're a significant part of the future. Um, Bitcoin, at least to my understanding, has been founded as a decentralized payment system, and and to a certain degree. It serves that function very well, but only to a certain degree, because one area where 
personally, I believe Bitcoin has failed and I'm still a big Bitcoin fanboy, right? Don't get me wrong about that. <laughs> of course, of course. But one area where Bitcoin has failed is to be a reliable store of value. Um, uh, when, when I started to use Bitcoin and to get excited about it, which was about 2012, 2013, I thought, well, this is like a small cap stocks and, and, and smaller capitalized commodities have high volatility. But the moment the market cap goes beyond 30, 40, 50 billion dollars, um, it will be just as stable as a conventional currency. Now, well then. <laughs> and then we've reached, we've reached those market caps way quicker than I was expecting. However, the volatility didn't go away. It, it, it's lower. It's, it's definitely lower than where it was 2012, 2013. But it's nowhere near where you need it to be if you want to call Bitcoin a reliable store of value, right? So in that sense, in this very specific aspect, Bitcoin has failed. Now, some Bitcoin maximalists will say, well, this was never the goal. <laughs> Fine. But if you want to use it as a reliable tool to process payments, it's still too volatile, right? And therefore, stable coins come in, they leverage the fact that you can send tokens on the Stellar, on the Ethereum and on other blockchains very quickly at very low cost, but at the same time introduce the stability of value. And this combination is something that I believe many use cases need, and therefore stable coins will have a, a relatively broad usage going forward. Radoslav, I want to just bring it back before we wrap up. I wanted to ask quickly, um, you guys have been giving small business loans for the past, uh, how long have you been in business now? Since 2013. Five, six years then. And you started with Amazon resellers. And uh, I'm just wondering, have you seen the openness to crypto among these small businesses? Uh, change since 2013 has like for example the uh, was the Bitcoin uh, bubble of 2017 instrumental for getting more people excited about using this or, or how has that shifted in your time so to our users uh, there hasn't there hasn't been a big change I would say uh, simply because our users are interested in getting an affordable funding in a relatively quick decision process so that the loan gets paid out to them quickly instead of waiting for five or six weeks to get a credit decision from a bank. And they don't really care so much about which technologies we use in order to make that work. And so some of our customers, of course, are interested in, well, how do you do the payment processing and, and, and how do you make it happen that, that you work so efficiently and that you are so much quicker than banks? Um, but frankly, most of our customers don't really care about it too much. They simply look at the results that we produce, which is perfectly fine. When, when I look at myself, how I um, consume other services and, and other products, in most cases, I also simply don't even have the capacity and the time to understand, you know, how does the underlying tech work? How do the logistics work and, and, and all these things, right? Even if I was interested, I don't have the time to, to always care about that so deeply. And so the same is true for our customers. Some of them are very interested. Well, how do you make that work? Could I perhaps learn something from you for my own business? And could I improve my own processes with that knowledge? But that's perhaps 5 to 10% of our customers. And then the rest, you know, just do their business. And they're happy that we are able to provide them with a working capital loan quickly. Hmm. No, that makes sense. Um... And, and, and I think that you bring up uh, something that's actually really interesting that I, I, I heard a while ago uh, from uh, a couple of different panel discussions, that the average person doesn't care about decentralization. What they care about is that there's a well-managed product. And maybe this is, uh, maybe you've hit on something, that the, the way to crypto adoption in the future is to make the, the crypto layer invisible. 
Yeah, I, I certainly believe that this is one important aspect. You know, just like Linux as an operating system uh, is, is uh, has an extremely widespread use, but many people don't even know about it. You know, when they turn on their fridge yep. or <laughs> when they turn on their car or when they turn on their uh, Android mobile device, you know, that in, 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 in many of these instances, actually Linux is the underlying operating system, right? Most people don't even know it exists, right? And I think the same is true for blockchain. I mean, right now it's a hyped technology, but probably in 10 years from now, uh, a lot of the transaction processes and financial services, uh, a lot of supply chains, um, uh, uh, a lot of data will be stored in some way or the other through uh, decentralized ledgers and uh, a lot of people won't even know this technology exists, right? So I think that this is this is a way where this technology will go for sure. And then there will always be people who you know who who know what's going on under the hood, but it will probably just be a niche uh, group of people who have a deep understanding of the technologies that we're using. It's funny that the, the, I hadn't thought of that parallel before, but it really is accurate because I remember back in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, Linux was very similar to Bitcoin in that it was almost like a religion for the people that really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's ubiquitous, but it's because it's become invisible. And <laughs> All right, Radoslav, um, before we sign off, when do you launch your SEO and uh, how can people find out more information? So you can find more information at bitbondsto.com. That's where you can already today register for a waitlist where you will receive updates and where you will learn everything that you need to know about our token. And the actual token sale starts on March 11. And it makes sense to be there on March 11 because we're giving out early discounts to those people who subscribe and who invest very early on. And therefore, everybody who's interested, I highly recommend going to bitbornseo.com, uh, registering now and being there on the 11th of March. Radoslav, uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure having you here. It's really nice to follow up with you after well over a year that, uh, that we spoke last time. And uh, I'm glad. I wish you all the best with your STO. And thank you for coming on the show. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much. And looking forward to also seeing your podcast develop. And I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.